Today, today, today is we're talking about research methods. Research methods, chapter two, research methods. So, Sean, start us off. You felt sorry for us anthropologists or so, something like that. Compassion, yeah. compassion. I always like compassion. I feel like I need a lot of compassion. Why? Uh, just like reading like first couple like, pages, I felt compassion because there are like so many like rules and guidelines that they get to um, just like follow to make sure their research is like valid and could be validated. So yeah, that's kind of why. I mean, so you got you got really into kind of the the validity and the question of of bias and the experimentation. And all those things that were taught about in, you know, from, from fifth grade on where they teach you about the scientific method and the hypothesis and the falsifying the hypothesis and stuff. And there are some anthropologists who really do take that kind of uh, scientific method stuff super seriously. And so I guess for me, there's a couple different ways to play this, right? So on the one hand, anthropology is really hard and I'm not going to... I'm not gonna tell you that it's easy. It's a difficult, difficult thing to do. And so what I could do is then go into all this stuff about validity and bias and interviews. And, and I could tell you that, well, since we were trying to answer these big questions of Western thought, we had to make sure we had the most complete and rigorous scientific method that you could possibly imagine in order to do this work. But I guess for me, there's a different side of this, which is that if you really had to explain what the research method of most anthropologists has been over the past hundred years or so, how would you describe what it is? What would you say these people seem to be doing when you read their stories and their examples? What are they up to? Yes. <laughs> following around other people, right? The research method of anthropology, in my view, is very complicated and it is this, go somewhere, find some people, talk to them, try to participate, but don't become you know, too into it, don't go native, but you're also an observer. So I guess I would say that, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to do that, but in some ways, you yourself are the instrument of doing the work. And so in some ways, uh, the question of, of, of bias is, uh, of course, we don't want our anthropologists to be biased or anything like that. And we don't want to get biased information. But there's no other way to do it than to be personally immersed. That's all there is, really. So uh, research methods. I want to turn here to something that one of my, uh, probably the, the professor that, that I knew best, a, a very famous uh, anthropologist, Sidney Mintz, uh, who was really an extraordinary field worker. Um, and in the sense that he could really help uh, draw out what people were, uh, were talking about. And he was super interested in their lives. And he was also one of the first people to do field work in, he, his first field work was in Puerto Rico. And at the time, uh, anthropological field work was often done in these places that were considered, you know, way out of the way, as your book says, the idea of going off to kind of these isolated and so-called savage communities. Uh, there was a reason for that was that anthropologists thought they were trying to sort of capture uh, the world before colonialism. So Mintz and others went to Puerto Rico and they kind of changed in some ways or altered the way that anthropological fieldwork was done and that they were studying a society that was at that point coming increasingly under the control of the United States. And they were increasingly becoming a, a place where sugar cane was produced. And he wrote, uh, he wrote some things from his initial fieldwork, which was a study of that community but then he wrote a book called Worker in the Cane, a Puerto Rican life history, which was the story, uh, he sat down with one of his, the people that he knew best there, Tasso, 
And they just you know, basically went through his whole life. Uh, and he was really a pioneer in what we call the life history method, uh, which is on page 37. And he kind of connected that to, uh, to every, the other stuff that was going on in Puerto Rico and in the world. Uh, and uh, in some ways, I think uh, Mintz kind of just, he got super lucky with Tasso. Tasso was himself an amazing person who was actually doing uh, field work uh, with Mintz together. But it's really an incredible story about this. Actually, I wanted to pause there. Lexi, you were talking about a, a, a YouTube channel that this reminded you of and how this person does these kinds of life histories. Tell us about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, I mean, the, the, kind of, the idea of doing ethnography or, you know, immersing yourself or doing life histories, is not unique to anthropology and other people can do it pretty well. Um, and your question was, you know, why, why do people, why do people talk? to others. And I would say some people don't, right? I mean, then a lot of people don't want to talk and you never find out. You don't, you don't hear them and so you don't, don't know what they're saying. Uh, but some people, I think, like Tasso, really do think that their story can say something that has not been heard before. And so, uh, you know, I think that what might differentiate the anthropological approach is how much you use that to illustrate some of these wider themes uh, in society or in the world. So with that as an introduction, uh, Mintz wrote uh, what he called a traditional anthropological catechism. And uh, I don't know how many, I think catechism comes to us from basically Catholicism. It's a statement of belief, right? A statement of belief. So this is what uh, Mintz calls his uh, traditional anthropological statement of belief. And the, this is about doing field work. Study what you can see and hear, record everything you can. So again, uh, yeah, we wanna make sure we don't have bias and we, do, we try to be as open-minded as possible as we're going in, but really it's about going there, setting yourself down and just trying to soak it up and, at the, in the old days, writing everything down, or some of your, the people in here also talk about just having notebooks and that's all they had. Uh, so that's uh, the first part of this. And then Mintz says something which is extremely, I think, when you've done a little bit of anthropological field work important, which is to not expect it to be entirely consistent. And oftentimes we go off and we think that we're going to discover the culture or ev that everybody's going to kind of line up in a place. We should know already that life is messy and life is messy here and it's going to be messy wherever you're doing your field work. And so don't expect things to all line up and sort of uh, some people feel that, that the interpretation is just going to come to them. It's hard. It's hard to figure this out. So you try and record all this stuff. And then he says, listen. And I want to pause here on the listen part for a bit, because it sounds simple, but I, in my, in my belief, this is one of the most important aspects of anthropology, of not just being an anthropologist, but what we can, in some ways, hopefully help other people uh, to do which is listening in the sense of seriously listening and taking other people seriously, of not dismissing other views out of hand, uh, as Lexi put it, you know, really going into people's lives and just kind of trying to figure out what's going on from their perspective, from their place. And so uh, being able to listen to other people as fellow human beings is hugely important uh, to, to doing any kind of work, uh, especially in anthropology. And then he added this line, count the ancillary blessings of discomfort. So ancillary means additional or extra. The extra blessings of discomfort. So in this case, uh, Mintz was living in a, in, a, in a cane worker's shack 
And, uh, you know, it's not always, as you've read in the text, it's not always the most comfortable uh, position. And so what Mintz was trying to say here is that getting yourself out of your comfort zone might help to, you know, to help you to understand what other people's lives are like and, and make, some, uh, make some sense of it. Of course, Jalen asks us, there's, there's a level of discomfort which you didn't want to go to, Jalen. What level of discomfort did you not want to get to in your field work? You were not into that. As you asked, is it worth losing your life over? My answer to that is there are very few things that I want to lose my life over. And, uh, you know, I guess people lose their lives over stupider stuff. But uh, I would say I don't want to do that. And so I want to back up from sort of the, I want to keep it at the level of ancillary blessings of discomfort. I don't want to... Uh, I want to, don't want to go in that other direction, but it is true that it can be, you know, there are diseases that, that have circulated and there are anthropologists that have, you know, fallen to their deaths or not been in, a, been in accidents and all these things. Um, some of those happen to other people in life anyway, uh, but, uh, you know, if, if at all possible, you, do, you don't want to, you don't want to lose your life for, you know, you have to be careful about losing your life. So count the ancillary blessings of discomfort. And then he sums it up to say, here's the last part of the catechism. If those items in the catechism, if all those things I said, do not add up to a methodology for other sterner disciplines, so be it. So what I think he's saying here is that if you compare this to, uh, you know, I. I guess I would say some sterner discipline. So he may be talking about uh, some something like sociologists who have their rigorous quantitative interview methods. He may be talking about chemistry or physics. I'm not exactly sure what he means by the sterner disciplines, but I think he's talking about people who are like way into the scientific method to the extent that uh, that they 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 disregard. Uh, what is essentially people going to places and talking and trying to get this uh, rich information. So he's like, ah, if they don't like it, that's fine. They have, I believe, nonetheless helped to reveal, reveal worlds otherwise hidden or unimagined. Which is to say that if, if a lot of the things that we know about other people in the world, a lot of the things that, that anthropologists have discovered would never have been even thought about uh, if anthropologists hadn't done this thing of going there and just sat down with people and tried to do what they did and tried to listen to them and tried to understand them, those things would have never uh, been revealed at least to the West. So that's kind of what he's trying to say here about the main lesson of anthropology. Um, the, a lot, uh, uh, again, a lot of uh, you got interested in the idea of, of interview bias here and, and how that plays into things and how you, how you reveal these otherwise uh, hidden worlds. And of course, the very first example, as, as Jalen has been talking about, is the person who, who does the gangs. Uh, Jonathan, you also liked, or I think you liked, the gang person. What did you get out of that? Well, yeah, I, I guess this is kind of a famous gang, right? They've been, they've been uh, recently even more politicized than they were back. I think he might not have done this, like, before, I don't think people knew as much about them before, you know, they got all ginned up as like being the worst gang in the world. Um, and, you know, I think you, we also have to remember that his original field work was, uh, was simply with uh, his Central American communities. And then, you know, it was like after a while he started getting drawn into this other, uh, this other thing. And you wanted to know 
if there was more work on these kinds of things. And at first I couldn't, I didn't know about that, but then I remembered there's a extremely famous uh, anthropologist that was often assigned for almost every anthropological course at one point in time uh, named Philippe Bourgois, who wrote several books. I think this might still be his uh, most famous book. Uh, I think his most recent book was called Righteous Dope Fiend. So uh, that was interesting. But uh, In Search of Respect, Selling Crack in El Barrio. Uh, and there's also, uh, there's several articles that he wrote uh, from this work. Uh, so if you're really, if you're really into that kind of stuff, uh, that would be uh, a place to turn. Like I said, a lot of people used to assign uh, this, this book and some of his other work. For me, well, let me ask you this. What do you most remember about that gang work? The Gangsters Without Borders. What's the biggest thing that sticks in your mind? If I say, hey, or if you say to your parents, hey, what did you learn about Gangsters Without Borders? What are you gonna tell them? Is there any scene that sticks in your mind? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what will always be seared into my mind. Whenever I think of Gangsters Without Borders, if I have to think about it, I'm gonna think, Shit, man, there was an anthropologist had a gun to his head and a knife to his throat. You wouldn't believe it, mom. So, <laughs> all right, so that was, that's pretty dramatic. Does anybody know what he was trying to say? Like, what was the point? Yeah, well... Yeah, he was trying to humanize them. There it is. In their own way, they were looking for family security, status, and self-respect. Hey, search of respect. Right? And I mean, I think this was also Bourgeois' main point, too, was that the people who were doing this thing that we, that we looked at as like, how could you possibly do this, were actually doing it for reasons that they basically wanted to attain a lot of things that we talk about as the American dream, and they wanted respect in their own communities. Now, Bourgeois does also make the point that this ends up in a, in a self-destructive and community-destructive process. It's not that you're valorizing it, but he wanted to understand what the motivation was. Again, for me, I feel like when you're dealing with these kinds of activities, you have to provide a huge amount of context. Otherwise, the thing that's gonna stick in your mind is, dude, that's the anthropologist who works on crack houses or the guy with the gun to his head, instead of what you're actually trying to say about the people, which is, hey, they were looking for family security, status, and self-respect. Those are things that I like too. Family security, status, and self-respect. So, you know, do I want to relate to an MS-13 gang member? I don't know, but we can do it if we contextualize it a lot. So this is my kind of issue. That's why I actually don't assign uh, uh, Philippe Bourgeois because I feel like he doesn't provide enough context for the kinds of things uh, that he's describing. For the, because a lot of that does become sensationalized. But the point of the matter is, in Bourgeois, in Ward's work, in all of these things, they've definitely revealed some stuff that we may not have, we may not have thought about, may have been hidden or unimagined. So what should field work do? What should field work do? Uh, in some ways, like we just talked about, it should be a, a way of documenting or uh, trying to help understand these things that might have been otherwise uh, hidden from view. And remember we talked about how uh, these are answers, empirical or fieldwork or 
we actually, we do define empirical in here in that little box on page 41, verifiable through the senses, either directly or through extensions on observation and data. So we talked about these big issues of the West as being theological and then philosophical and then uh, kind of uh, scientific, and that anthropology is meant to provide this empirical or data-driven answer. And one of the answers that anthropology provides is that people learn how to do these things. They learn these things. And the reason people behave and think and act differently all over the world is not because of their biology or because of their race or because of their natural environment, but because of this culturally learned behavior, which we can at least partially learn too as an anthropologist going into a place. So many people have compared anthropology doing field work to becoming a child in another society. You become dependent upon the people that you're working with and in some ways grow up a little bit within that society. So again, it should be in answer to those big questions that the West was asking, uh, we should understand then that people are not determined by their race or biology. So doing field work should show us the range of possible individual and group behavior and that people are not uh, arranged in some sort of hierarchy where some people have capacities and some people don't, or those that, that terrible stuff that we read from Charles Darwin about how some people have language and some people don't. And so, you know, we should then understand that other people have sophisticated uh, and interesting ideas. It should also help us to know, as we talked about in the last class, that we are not determined by our natural physical environment or by uh, the trajectory of history or by our biology. So it should speak to us uh, to these kinds of human possibilities. It's also, hopefully, for the anthropologist, transformative. That is to say, as you're going about this thing, you're growing up and you're starting to become more tolerant. Uh, in your textbook, they talk about the idea of reflexivity or thinking about your own experience and reflecting upon it as you go through uh, this process. So this is what, it, what field work should do, ideally what it should do in, in the world and as you're doing your studies out there. And so I wanna put up a quote from you from uh, one of the founders of, of US anthropology, considered to be one of the biggest founders, kind of like the, our version of, of Malinowski. You may have read about uh, Bronislaw Malinowski over in the Brit side as a founder of fieldwork. Over here in the US, we have Franz Boas, who did a very similar thing where he was going to live with uh, other people and try and learn everything about them. You don't have to write this down, but I just want you to reflect a little bit on it. This was something that Boaz, one of the founders of anthropology, uh, wrote in The Nation in 1938. So what, 80 years ago, right? About a little more. My whole outlook upon social life is determined by the question, how can we recognize the shackles that tradition has laid upon us? For when we recognize them, we are also able to break them. Now, I guess to me, this is something that, that if you think about us to, from today's world and what anthropology is now, this might seem weird. Right, because we think we come to anthropology to study tradition and to study culture. And here's Franz Boas saying that tradition can shackle us. And so we need to understand these shackles, right? The things that people get bound by, the shackles that tradition has laid upon us so we can break it which is not 
bless you, which is not what you probably might expect from most anthropologists we're supposed to be, you know, respecting traditions and all that stuff. So what I think Boaz is trying to say here, again, in the spirit of the non-determinism thing, is that if we understand that our learned behavior can be different and can be changed, then we might be able to do something different, uh, both within our own society. I don't think we want to tell other people to change, but certainly at least reflecting upon changes that we could make within our own society based on this understanding of what tradition uh, can do for us. So this was uh, a hopefully an optimistic statement about fieldwork, about anthropology, a somewhat different statement than many people might think about anthropology today. As the years wore on from those early anthropologists in the 1920s and 1930s and Malinowski and those kinds of things, anthropology developed uh, what some people have called a fieldwork trilogy, uh, which is the idea that the best or one great model for doing anthropological fieldwork was to go out and to be your one person, your one field worker, who would go to one place, one village, and stay there for one year. So that would be how you do your basic anthropological field work. And of course, people did all kinds of different things, but this was, was sort of became a model for how you'd, how you'd do that. And then you'd come back home and you'd write your, write your, uh, your work up and you'd present it, you'd maybe write a book. Uh, and then you'd have your, your PhD, and then you could start, start teaching classes. So I guess I want to ask here, what would be the advantages of being, of doing it this way? Why, did, why would this be something that would be helpful to people? Uh, as why, why would we think that this was a good model for anthropological field? Yes, John. Because of like, people going into it with like, a set amount of time, so like, they could like, a set amount of time. Why a year? Yes. Yeah, I mean, we have these things that happen every year, right? And so the, one of the ideas was if you stay for a year, you're basically going to go through an annual you know, the whole year. So you'll figure out, you know, every year we have our annual December holidays, right? So you'd at least catch those. You wouldn't miss them if you were there for, for the whole year. And I think that we also have to keep in mind in most societies that you're, what do you have to do during the year in the old days? We don't do this much anymore because of refrigerators. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and how do we do that, right? In most societies, we, they rely on a kind of agricultural cycle, right? So you go through and you plant and you harvest and then you store the food. No, you plant, you grow, you tend, you harvest, you store, you know, so there's this annual cycle of the agricultural cycle as well. Now this, of course, doesn't happen in all societies and other people do things differently, but there was this idea that in many places, people went through an annual cycle, which was often related to the food cycle as well. So again, things like our own Thanksgiving is supposedly at least partially linked to the harvest, uh, but those kinds of festivals that would take place linked to the agricultural cycle. And the idea was if you could go through the year, you could get that. Okay, good. 
We're good on the year. How about some of these other things? What, why might, why might it be good to only have one field worker there? Yeah, John. <laughs> Don't want to have too many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah, I mean, there is probably a sense that you don't want to send too many people into the same little place because it might overwhelm things. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, I mean, if you think about being one person in a small place, you get forced to be immersed, right? You have to, you, there's nobody else there. There's nobody else in the kitchen to talk to, let's put it that way. And so you have to talk to the people who are there. You have to learn the language. There's no, there's no outlet, especially in the old days. You couldn't just go down to the internet cafe. Um, so that would be force you to be immersed in that situation. What about one village? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there was in some ways an idea that, you know, if you if you were in too many, you couldn't do too many different things, especially if you were in a in a one year situation. What else? I mean, for those of you who may come from us, when I say a village, I'm talking about, you know, a small town, let's say about uh, the 400 people variety. What, do, what happens to you in a small town? Yeah, you get to know everybody, right? So the idea is if you, we go to this one place and you know, there's 300 or 400 people in this village that we're in, you can get to know everybody. So you won't miss anybody. And, and so the idea was you could, you could go to uh, this, this one place for one year and, and get to know everything about it, basically. And I would also add here that at the time, the, the, there, the idea was there are all these places and there aren't that many anthropologists, so we better get out there. You wouldn't want to have uh, all your people in one place. You want to spread out all over the place because, hey, you know, people are, uh, we have to hurry up before they all, they all change. So this was a kind of idea about uh, doing field work, which became, uh, which became kind of the, the standard for doing anthropological field work, in some ways still perhaps persists to this day. One of the interesting things about this chapter is if you turn, if you look at the first part of this chapter, research methods, page 26, and then it goes over into page 27. What's the, what's the thing you most notice besides research methods in the first part of this chapter? What do you most notice, Michelle? Yeah, there's actually this little wheel here, all these orange boxes is a fairly prominent, uh, prominent uh, thing here. And all of it says problems with ethnography, which is kind of striking. I mean, here we have research methods, right? So we're supposed to be going into ethnography, which is the anthropological research methods. And then you look on the very next page. You're not even into the text very far. The first figure is problems with ethnography. And it, I guess it was striking to me because I, I feel like anthropology is one of the only disciplines that when you come into it, we tell you what's good about it. And then we almost immediately tell you all the problems that we have. with it. I don't think this happens in a chemistry class, for example. I don't think you come into your chemistry class and they give you the scientific, they give you a beaker, and then they tell you all the problems you're going to have with this beaker. I don't even think it happens in many of our social science or history 
classes, I don't think they are as self-critical and as kind of having this uh, immediately presenting you with the problems. I'm not sure. Maybe they do, but I have my doubts. So it leads us to this question or uh, what I want to concentrate on here is why I can get that to advance now. No. Of what we don't see are some of the problems that we have if we're doing this one field worker, one village, one year kind of thing. So, what might we not see? What might we miss? What are the problems of doing this kind of thing? Let's start with the one field worker problem. Here I am, I've gone into a village and there's something going on and somebody's off planting things and other people are cooking things. And I'm a guy, yeah, Johnson. Yeah, it's often it's often difficult for you know uh, th there are a lot of societies that do not all but a lot do break up some of these tasks. Some are stricter than others, so it's oftentimes difficult to jump into the other sphere. And some people didn't even bother to try. That is to say, there are uh, Malinowski, for example, one of the founders of ethnographic fieldwork, is rather famous for not at all describing what the women were doing in this society. Um, and so there was a, a Annette Weiner came along about 50 years later and did a very different kind of follow up study in the same community and discovered all this other stuff that was going on that must have been going on when Malinowski was there. Um, so sometimes people would be prohibited from getting access to the other, uh, the other side of things. And sometimes uh, people just didn't bother because, you know, why? Uh, so that was, uh, that's one uh, aspect to this that, that is, is a limitation. You also might think about, here I am off you know, by myself in a different place. And, uh, you know, for me personally, doing my first field work, I was very isolated as one field worker. And then I did some field work where I was, I had a, a person who was, who was with me. We did some um, teamwork later. And I have to say, it was really interesting that this, we'd see the same things and then being able to talk about it, we realized that we both had different takes on what had just happened. So I guess I would just say, there's also the issue of you know, perspective and being able to, to talk to other people and, and figure out what happened. And if you're only one person, it's, it can be kind of limiting. All right, let's see. Well, Leah's kind of told us about one of the problems perhaps of only seeing one village is that, you know, well, what happens in the village down the road, right? I mean, is it gonna be the same, different? So it's actually, uh, you know, it's difficult here to see, um, I guess I would see, to see more the interconnection, those kinds of things, if you're only in one place. And then uh, the other thing that is kind of, uh, well, let's see. Hey, is anybody from a small town of like, you know, under a thousand people? <laughs> under, uh, there are no small towners here. Not like me. Kind of, a little small townish. Let me just ask you this. Is anybody planning on going back to where they came from? after college, like I'm gonna go to college and I'm going straight back to my hometown. 
<laughs> yeah, some people are, and that's great, and I love you all. But honestly, why do most of us go to college, right? We're trying to get out. And you know what? There's a lot of people in little villages all over the world who really want to leave. And so if you're doing anthropology on the little village, you're missing all the people who left the village, right? They're gone. They might come back every so often and, you know, visit and throw some, throw some money and respect around, but, you know, they're not there. So, you know, you can't see, uh, let's see. <laughs> you know, and when we could also say, now that I've discovered that most of you are not from these small towns, well, what about the cities? What about the places where most people actually live uh, in today's world? How do we study those if we're always off in these sort of rural village areas? What about, uh, you know, most of the world's population lives in, uh, in, in larger, larger environments? How about the year, the year part of things? What do you not get from just staying there for a year? Haley. Yeah, you might, he might be at the point of actually finding something out and you're gone, right? I, and I think, especially if you don't speak the language very well, right? If you haven't had much language training, you know, uh, a year is is not is not that long. Yeah. Um, You're only going to see one cycle, and it's very difficult to get a sense of, hey, is this the same as it was? I mean. It's weird in human societies how quickly we forget things and how quickly we also establish things like tradition. I know in my own family, we'll do something for two or three years in a row and then we think we've always done it that way, right? Or, you know, I mean, if you go back, it's very difficult for people to remember what things, I can't, I can't even remember what it was like not to be able to check my email on my phone you know, that was like, I, that's hard for me to even imagine that life was like that. And so for human societies, and this is not just us, um, basically anything that has been done since your grandparents is forever. And so it's very difficult to get this sense if you're only there for a year and if there aren't things to read, if there's not archives, uh, it's very difficult to get this sense of history. I wanna talk about uh, one other thing that you may miss if you're only there for a year, although you can miss it in all kinds of ways, are the ways in which people have been and all uh, interconnected. And so, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things that we trade with each other that then get incorporated into, into our lives. And so, you know, it's, it's difficult to think about, uh, let me give you an example. It's difficult to think about um, Italian food without tomatoes. I mean, you can try, but you know, a lot of tomatoes there, right? But you know, where did the Italians get those tomatoes? There were no tomatoes in Italy before the voyages of Columbus. There were no potatoes in Ireland before they got them from the Andes in the Americas. There were no horses on the plains of the Americas for the American Indians to ride before the... So all these things seem so ingrained in person society, but they come to us from this trade in, 
interaction, corn, corn in most societies, rice, these kinds of things that, that flow along. Difficult to see without, uh, without going there. All right, so. And to take this a bit further, a lot of these early anthropologists, admittedly anthropology started off with a lot of very famous women like Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict. But a lot of these were sort of these single anthropology guys who were off trying to do their thing in one village for a year. Actually, interestingly, the two people who were gonna talk the most to me about anthropological ethics and what might happen to the anthropologists are not here. But so we'll just have to imagine what might happen to a guy stuck in a village for a year. Might do some things that are not very nice might not do, do all the anthropological ethics things. So, you know, the problem is, is part of this is that the anthropological experience became a ticket to getting a, a PhD and getting a job. And you might be willing to, uh, whenever money depends on, on it, you might be willing to sacrifice uh, those wider ideals. Um, but so that's one issue. But I think the bigger issue for me is not simply what you don't see. Um, obviously, we want to always be ethical. But the other question is, if we have these anthropologists going off and doing these field work where they portray these communities as isolated places, which are bound by their culture and traditions, and they're all kind of homogeneous because you've only been in one village and you don't have a sense of history. So you portray them as if they're kind of stuck in time and they don't change. Then what kind of a book or what kind of a vision are we selling of the world? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it's not an, it's, it's, first of all, not an accurate description of the world. It's just incorrect. And, you know, I don't, I don't like to do things that are incorrect. But I guess I would push it a little bit. What is it about this incorrectness that is especially harmful like it's one thing to just be wrong but well yeah i mean it's it's basically going back it's basically resurrecting those old ideas that we were trying to get away from in the first place right i mean you've basically kind of put them back in the race box you know i mean this is basically race all over again is basically saying that people are shackled by their tradition, that they can't change, that they are determined by their culture. And so one of the problems is, you know, anthropology has been super successful at convincing people that, yeah, these things are maybe not biological, they're cultural, but then it becomes this way of simply dismissing things. It's like, oh yeah, well, you know, that's their culture. They're not going to wake up this morning because that's their culture. Um, and so it, it becomes a way of writing off a whole group of people uh, with either good or bad stereotypes and not showing us the range of human behavior. So agreed, it's technically incorrect, but it's also a potentially uh, damaging contribution to uh, the kinds of things we might want to uh, to do in the world and the ways in which we might want to think about 
of people other than ourselves. So a lot of you got into this part about digital anthropology. For this part, all up until now, we've been mainly talking about what we might consider traditional anthropology. We barely got past the 1950s. So the digital anthropology stuff, which starts on page 44 and takes up a good amount of the chapter, is, um, is, is an interesting new angle, just like it's a new angle in our own lives. And I guess the question is, is does that help us a lot? Does it kind of do the kinds of things that we wanted anthropology to do before? Now maybe we can do them in the digital world. And so there's the question of, well, if we do digital anthropology, well, then we can tell how people are interconnected to each other. And we can uh, maybe access their thoughts and ideas like we never uh, were able to before. And so a lot of people have turned to digital anthropology. Um, there have been anthropologists who've done their field work in, uh, I think there was a game called Second Life and they became an avatar in that game. So kind of like the movie Free Guy, except you're an anthropologist in there interacting with people and, and basically doing your field work uh, within that digital world. There are other anthropologists who have inhabited the, the online uh, sort of, you know, the chat communities that might be centered around a particular brand. So a lot of this comes up in, in business anthropology or uh, increasingly uh, social media. Um, I guess I would say uh, in, in answer to this question is, uh, yeah, a lot has changed, but in some ways, I think at least at first in digital anthropology, it hasn't changed everything in the sense that uh, it still kind of pre preserves often this idea that there's these strange internet cultures out there. And as we know now from what the internet seems to do, we used to think it would bring us all together, but it seems to be that you find your little part of the internet and you just stay in that part of the internet and with people who are thinking your thing. So like uh, the internet itself, it seems to lead to these kinds of, uh, not talking about so much how people are interconnected, but how they are uh, being separated. I think, I think that there are some perhaps lessons learned from the digital thing I'm not sure about this, this is still developing. Um, for me, I think that one of the lessons in anthropology is, is that for one thing, almost everybody in the world, you have to go really far away not to find people uh, before you encounter people who are not somehow digitally involved. And a lot of times this happened earlier in places uh, in places where they didn't have, say, for example, telephone infrastructure, they adopted cell phones and texting much earlier than we did in the United States. So uh, the first thing I would say is, hey, you know, if, if the people you are studying with are digital, then you better be digital yourself. So you better be try and get into their uh, networks. Uh, I remember, so when I did my first field work in Colombia, I was living in a place where we didn't have, they didn't have a telephone. We had electricity and water, but no telephone. And it took like, I, I actually documented the process of this because it took about six months to, from applying for a telephone line to finally getting this telephone line uh, put into place. And I remember getting when we got the first telephone call in this house that I was living with. Very exciting moment. So then I went back about 10 years later and everybody had like two or three different cell phones and now they're all on Facebook and they message me. So the thing is, is if, you know, that that would be something that, that if I were to do field work again, I'd certainly be looking at some of these changes as well as trying to be digital as well. The other lesson I think is that, that uh, if we do something that is digital, 
you probably also have to try to talk to the people who are digital uh, in some sort of real life uh, setting. Um, sometimes this is possible, sometimes it's, it's less possible just for reasons of access, but it's always good to kind of uh, interplay these things. And then Aaron had an interesting question about why are people less inhibited online, right? Why do people do and why do people say things online that they would never say in person, I think is how I took it, right? And um, it's an interesting, it's a really interesting question. Some of you may have heard the saying that, we, you know, I always wanted to know what people are thinking and then Facebook came along. And now I know what they're thinking and now I don't want to know what they're thinking anymore, right? Because, whoa, no, that's, I didn't really want to know that about that person. So there is that aspect to it. And some people say, well, that's our real personality. <laughs> like our uninhibited personality is those stupid things we post online and we're only limited in real life from, from saying and doing the things we would do online. Um, other people would claim that our real selves are the ones that are in person and the online thing is just, you know, that's just silly. So I guess, you know, I mean, we can, there are different, obviously different possible answers to this, but I would stress that I think what we've learned is that when we are in so-called real life, we, are always performing. And this is, goes back to people, uh, Goffman and others who've talked about, you know, the, the, the self as a performance. So that's a performance. There's not that, you know, I mean, that doesn't make it less real, but we do have to realize that when we do things, what I'm doing now, what you're doing now is in some ways a performance and we have uh, an audience. And the same thing goes with digital identity. So they perform for an audience. Now, some people are anonymous, but there are other people who are in some ways may feel more inhibited online because their audience is larger and because they are, some people are expecting them to do something. They're running a YouTube channel and they're needing to do, to produce a certain kind of product. So for me, I don't think either one of these is, is more real or more fake than the other. We just have to understand that they are, they are different types of performances and we, it's important to analyze them as such. And even when we're getting somebody's long life history, that's also a performance, right? That's also a way of expressing, uh, of expressing a different, uh, a version of your life. So it's always important to keep that in mind.